a quick and dirty little slideshow um, that just highlights some moments over the last four years um, because that's actually when I started when I started baking bread um, was about four years ago and I, I basically started baking because um, a friend who was traveling through San Francisco gave me a sourdough starter and he scribbled down some instructions you know I saw him we were just chatting in my kitchen and I saw he had a little a little uh yogurt container with a little brown lump in it. And I was like, what are you doing with that? What, what is that? He said, it's sourdough, sourdough starter. I said, well, why, why do you have it? He said, because I bake bread. I like to bake bread. I'm traveling. I was like, but you can't bake good bread at home. And he kind of laughed. He said, yeah, you can. Here, have some. And he wrote down some instructions on a piece of paper. And, you know, within a week I tried it and I was just immediately smitten with with baking. Um, and I started doing it all the time. <clears throat> and I started doing it all the time, mostly because I loved the process of making a loaf of bread. Um, I also love eating bread, but I could only eat so much bread. And so I started um, giving it away. And one day, one of my neighbors, who whom I'd often give a loaf to, he said, um, he said, hey man, I'll give you a few bucks for that. And I was like, no, Michael, you don't need to pay me. For He's like, no, really. And I was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, give me your money, man. <laughs> and, and very quickly, um, I realized that by selling the bread, I could bake more and I could actually like not be losing money and so I think this, this is, I started my blog in August of 2010 and I started baking in April and I started selling bread to my coworkers over at UC Berkeley because for the five years before that I was uh, writing children's books and teacher's guides over at the Lawrence Hall of Science at UC Berkeley and you know, they knew I was falling in love with baking because I was blabbing about it all the time. And I talked a few of them into this wacky idea I had of a bread subscription. I said, listen, you give me 20 bucks. I'll give you a loaf of bread every week for the next four weeks. And I got like 15 people to do it. And voila. So this is my first blog post. Holy moly, it's happening. Hi, friends. Holy moly, it's happening. I'm selling bread. And people like it. This is so totally rad, it's making my eyes pop out of my face. Not really, but I'm pumped up. So that was the beginning, and <laughs> this is <laughs> what's happening these days. Um, this, is, this is in the mission, um, and this is a poster for, for Good Eggs, which is this really great company based here in San Francisco. And they're like an online farmer's market. And uh, they were really influential to me because um, about a year in to baking my bread and doing my bread subscription, you know, I'd quit my day job. I was, I was going for it. But the bread subscription had become so much, um, so many, so many logistics to manage by myself and not really having ever done anything like this before. It was really taking up a lot of my time and, um, I had some some bread sales that I was doing. Um, wait, not yet. It's a bread sales I was doing through through the bar I was working and um, through a place where I was using their oven. And I, I was actually I'd stopped doing the bread subscription, but Good Eggs helped me pick that back up and helped me keep moving. Thanksgiving of 2010, I had a little article written about me in uh, in an online newsletter. It was just like, hey, there's this guy in the mission. He's baking bread. He's selling it out of this little shop. And I got a ton of emails from strangers saying, we want bread for Thanksgiving. Bake us bread for Thanksgiving. And I wasn't planning on doing that, but, you know, I, I don't like to let people down. So, so I went for it. And on Thanksgiving of 2010, I baked uh, 60 loaves of bread in my home oven. It's funny, looking at these loaves of bread now, I'm like, oh my God, those look so crappy. 
<laughs> but as you can see in my face, I was not thinking that then. I was <laughs> just very excited, um, as I am today, because all of you are here. And I know some of you, but I don't know a lot of you. So thank you again for coming. So that's me when I was baking bread at home. And um, and I was still baking bread at home, which I know because I can tell by the way that loaf looks. Um, <laughs> but I was also working at this bar in the mission called Amnesia. And I would bring in the bread from my home and I'd hide it under the bar and I'd cut up a few slices like I did tonight and I'd let people sample it. And after a f few weeks of that, I'd have people coming in and saying, hey, are you, is this where I can get the bread? <laughs> yes, it is. That's a little speakeasy b bakery. Um, but September 2010 to April 2011, because in April 2011, I said, screw this, I'm going in all the way. I'm going to quit my bartending job. I'm going to I'm going to try to bake full time. And so that's about a year. It's about a year after I started baking, I said I'm in. And I kind of I was very scared to do it. But I put the pressure on myself to not have any other source of income so that I could I could really give it a go because, I mean, the reason I, I jumped into baking so so lovingly is because I, I had this naive idea that my job could be something that I loved because for whatever reason, it really stuck out to me how often I heard about people working eight hours a day doing something that they they didn't like or they didn't find meaningful um and i said i got to at least try you know and so i tried and that's me at mission pie which was this amazing pie it is this amazing pie bakery in the mission and um i uh once i once i quit the bartending i knew i needed to really go for it and I needed a, a real oven and so I s started walking around the neighborhood just going into bakeries and saying hey can I rent space from you when you're not using your oven and most places were like no goodbye <laughs> but one place <coughs> two places eventually one place uh, in the mission mission pie I went by a few times with loaves of bread each time sort of reminding them that I was still interested and um Karen and Kristen, two really amazing women, eventually said, okay, let's give it a shot. You come in here once a week. You can come in between these and these hours, and you can only use this space, and you have to have 10 loaves available for walk-in customers because I was mostly doing the bread subscription at that point. And within a few months, you know, I was selling 100 loaves out of there a day, and we said, okay, let's do it two days a week. So I'm doing a two days a week there. I, I um, met another very generous man, uh, Charlie, who owns Pizzaiolo over in Oakland. And we started doing the same thing over there where I wasn't employees of these businesses. I would rent space from them to run my business because I didn't want anybody telling me how to do it. Cause that, that was really part of the fun for me was figuring out how to make the whole thing work. And part of making the whole thing work was delivering it around town on my bicycle. And so this was, this was my setup for a while. Um, I'd bring, sometimes I'd bring everything with me. I'd make the bread and then I'd bring everything away and deliver it around town. And so I had like different pickup spots for my bread subscription at offices around town and different stores started selling it from Buy Right Market. Um, one thing I don't have a picture of, which is good, is uh, one day I had this this stack piled up really high. I think I had about 100 loaves of bread. And I went around a corner a little too tight. And I saw, I saw it in the driver's face before I knew what was going on. They went like this. <laughs> like, what was it? What did they do? What did they do? And I fell over. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it was very, it was very sad. It really bummed me out, and obviously I couldn't couldn't bring that bread to people. But um, so that summer, 2011, this guy emails me, who is a buddy. He's, his name is Jeremy. He's the the owner and founder of Four Barrel Coffee, which was a great cafe uh, roastery on Valencia Street that I frequented. Loaf, drop off loaves of bread. He emails me and he says, he says, hey, Josie, I've got, I got an idea and I got a space. And I, w- I want to know if you want to work on a project together. And he brings me to this, this place on Divisadero, this place right here, which it actually looks cooler here than it did when he first showed it to me. When he first showed it to me, it was just this totally abandoned, um, very messy market. He said, "Let's let's like let's do a project together. Let's do, I'll, I'll run the cafe and you can run the bakery." What do you think? And I was like, "Jeremy, I have no idea what I'm doing. Are you? <laughs> but yes, let's do it. And but you know, I just gotta let you know I have some things planned. So." I'm going to need to be gone for periods of time. He said, no, no, that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We'll figure it out. So I have some things planned. (laughs) Like, I mean, I like to have fun. You know, this is me at Burning Man um, shooting a flamethrower into the sky. Um, I also uh, went on a trip with my my now fiancé. We're actually getting married in a couple of weeks, but we traveled around uh, Southeast Asia together for two months. And this is all, this is, so I, I planned this trip to Southeast Asia with my, my girlfriend. And then Jeremy from Four Barrel says, hey, do you want to open a cafe bakery with me? I said, yes, I do. Right after that, I get a book deal. And so it was very, it was very exciting to have these opportunities just like popping up, um, but I still really wanted to go to Southeast Asia and see things like this and uh, do things like this. I don't know if you can see. That's me up there doing some rock climbing. This is the ocean down here. This is in Thailand, I believe. Shortly after this, I fell into the water like that. This is in Laos on a river. Okay. And so anyway, <laughs> and so I come back um, from the months away and the place still looks like this, you know? And I'm like, oh, right, right. I'm going to have to, uh, going to have to get my hands dirty in this thing. And so I spent a lot of time in that space um, helping to turn it into what it is today. I learned how to tile. Um, which I don't know if any of you have been been to the mill, but it's um, it's got a lot of tile in it, and me and a few other people did that. Um, there's some of that tile. And so we opened about a year ago, and it's funny, that bread rack, that bread rack has gotten a lot bigger because <laughs> we, we now make a lot more bread than we did at the beginning. Um, and so about, about three weeks after we opened, um, we shot all of the photographs for, for my book. We worked with this great photographer here in San Francisco, Erin Kunkel. And this is, this is me in her studio taking some photos. She took all the photos in the book. This is just, you know, I'm posing. Um, it wasn't great timing because... As you can imagine, you know, opening opening a business, a, a, a bread bakery, uh, took up a lot of my time and, and energy, and um, putting f- the photography of a book on top of that was was really challenging. But but we got it done. Um, so I think there's there's a photograph coming up that might be disturbing to some people so I'm going to go a little quickly but it's uh, it conveys a, a really unfortunate thing that happened to me um, 
that I did to myself um, about two months after we opened um, I fell I fell off my bicycle and um, and I went ahead and I posted this picture of myself on Instagram while I was in the dentist's office um, there we go yeah so yeah I won't I won't dwell on that one um, but yeah it was it was really really challenging um, Obviously, it's challenging to have that happen at any point in your life, but, <coughs> you know, I had to take a big step away from the business and uh, had to heal myself. And luckily, I had a team of people that were amazingly committed and talented, and they didn't skip a beat while I disappeared for a week and a half. And I would wander in there, you know, every couple of days and try to be helpful as much as I could. But I was really, I was pretty loopy. Um, the fork on my bicycle broke and, and I took a face plant um, in Golden Gate Park and, you know, woke up in an ambulance and yada, yada. Uh, it, was, it was terrifying. But... At the end of it, I got new teeth, <laughs> and they actually are are better looking than they were before, so I'm grateful for it. Um, and yeah, I mean, every every day we are trying as hard as we can to make the bread better than the day before, and we don't always do it, but hopefully over time, you know, w the goal is to every day to be able to honestly say, this is, this is the best bread ever. So this was a particularly pretty loaf. <laughs> so <laughs> you get it? They're, they're loafers. <laughs> And so there's that that thing, that little slice that we had no idea w what what a stir that was going to create. Um, we started serving toast at the. We we actually so we we had a tent set up inside of the mill for the seven months before we opened. And, you know, I'm a bread baker, and so. I would bring in loaves of bread and serve them as slices of toast, which is how I eat the how I eat the bread often. And um it just seemed to make sense to serve it up as toast. Little did we know that it would it would become very popular, but it would also become very controversial. And there was a few pieces of press that came out that accused us of uh, of ruining San Francisco with our toast, and you know it. Th the article brought up some really serious issues: the rising cost of living in San Francisco. Um, the city is is changing now, as it has been and as it will continue to, and. It's it's becoming increasingly uh, unaffordable for some people, and that's that's a problem, and um, a really complex one that that I don't have the answers to, but it's a conversation that needs to continue to occur. Um, I don't think that my toast is the reason for that. Um, nevertheless, um, something that I think my toast is a part of is, is the, a conversation around what the true cost of food is and the way that we've chosen to prepare our toast, just like the way Four Barrel has chosen to prepare their coffee, just like the way lots of restaurants 
and businesses here in the Bay Area and beyond choose to go about their craft is uh, it's expensive and it's labor intensive and our ingredients cost more than mass produced low quality foods. And I don't make any claims about everybody in the world needing to come to the mill and eat our toast the way that we choose to do it. We are, everyone is very free to eat or not eat toast however they like. Um, but if it's something that you find value in and you support the way that we run our business and the way that we conduct ourselves in our craft, then we'd love to share it with you, but no pressure. Um, and uh, recently, I'm really excited about our, our pizza nights. Um, we started doing pizza on Monday nights, and um, it's been really, really fun. Uh, every Monday night, it's like a party in there. And um, we just pick one, one vegetarian pizza to do each Monday. And uh, it's been really great. And this is the mill from the outside, which is, uh, other than my fiance, whom I'm about to become her husband, the mill is probably my, my, my closest relationship. <laughs> um, and, you know, I know that was more of a autobiographical show, but just, just to give a little intro to the book, it's, <coughs> in the grand scheme of things, I'm a beginning baker. You know, I started baking four years ago, and I started writing the book a year and a half after I started baking. And so I really wrote it to the me of a couple years prior. And so the first chapter is a series of recipes, and each one builds on the last so the first recipe is called your first loaf of bread. And then and it's just a bare bones, the simplest recipe that I could think of that would still get you to a nice home baked loaf. Because I think the most important thing for someone who hasn't baked much bread or any bread is for that first experience, that first baking experience, for it to be encouraging. You're not trying to make the best loaf of bread in the world. You're trying to make a good loaf of bread. And uh, then if you like it, you'll continue to do it because it's a really nice practice to be in the habit of. That's why I fell in love with it. And so, the fir so that's the first chapter. It starts off with your first loaf, and each recipe gets a little bit more complex. And that's all with, you know, commercial yeast. And it starts off, with, you know, with a sandwich loaf. And then you get into mixing the dough in multiple stages and um, making loaves that are not in pans. And uh, then we move on to sourdough bread. And then we get into all sorts of stuff, making bread with different grains, different flours, pizza. Um, the last chapter includes a bunch of recipes for sweets, like cookies and scones, and that kind of stuff. Um, so my hope is that it has something for everybody. But really, my, my, my biggest goal is for it to help people who haven't baked that much to fall in love with it. Can you talk about where you source your bread from? Sure. <laughs> of, of what? Bread of what? Sure. Yeah, so I work with this really amazing uh, small small family company up in Petaluma called Central Milling, or Keith Justo Bakery Supply. And they work with, with farms. Um, my, I get wheat that's grown in Washington and in Oregon. Um, my rye berries come from Canada. Um, but because we, taking on the milling was a big enough task. Um, you know, ultimately, I'd love to be sourcing the grains direct from farms, and I have a relationship with a farm that um, we're due to get a bunch of grain from their next harvest that's just 100 miles south of San Francisco. 
but for the time being, it's it's too much too much for us to deal with. And so we work with this company, and they they source the grains, and they do a really amazing job of it. And so basically, we can say, hey, we're looking for this kind of stuff. Do you have anything you'd suggest? And they say absolutely. So that's Central Milling up in Petaluma. And as far as bread machines, I think you know bread machines are great. Um, they make it very, very convenient to make a loaf of bread. And it can be really hard. I think for lots of people, one of the biggest obstacles about baking bread at home is fitting it into your schedule. And so a bread machine can be really helpful for that. Um, I think it's... I think it's... If you really want to get into it and get deep into making bread... Um, you'll probably want to, or maybe not, I wanted to have more control over all of the phases of bread making. And so if you do have that curiosity, then, you know, maybe you'll do the bread machine bread sometimes, and other times you'll do it, you do it all, all with yourself as the bread machine. Um, but, yeah, I got no problems with bread machines. Yeah. Yes, you, sir. Okay. The first part is, is bread good for you or bad for you? Mm. And the second part is, which is probably a better question. I like is, that. As part of an awesome nutritional whatever sure. or, you know, regime, where does bread fit in? Is it candy or is it like something you have every day? Or yeah. So somewhere, that, that kind of question. Awesome question. Yeah. I get asked this a lot. And um, I think lots of people are asking themselves this question these days, especially um, as it relates to gluten and how it affects their body. Um, and so I believe and I have experienced and I have heard from all people that I've talked about with the, on this topic that um, whole grain sourdough bread is good for you. Factory made white bread that's made on a huge scale is not good for you. So my favorite bread to eat is our dark mountain rye bread. So that's 100% rye, and it's 100% whole grain, and it's 100% sourdough. And I don't have a ton of science to back it up. I have my own experience and the experience of my customers that it makes me feel good. And obviously, if you eat too much of anything, it's not going to make you feel great. What's it been like coming into the baking scene with a lot of other famous Bay Area bakers, like Tim Tarkini? And do you get to learn from them, or are you competing with them? It's <coughs> a nice question. Yeah, it's 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 kind of hard for me to believe that I'm part of that. Um, but yeah, it's been very, f uh, very very flattering to to all of a sudden be considered a peer amongst these people who are really my, my heroes. Um, and one of the things that, I've, that I loved about baking from the very beginning was, was the sense of community among bakers. And we're a, we're a generous and, and friendly tribe, it seems. And... Um, yeah, I've always um I was I was just amazed at how willing other bakers were to share what they know and what they think about baking. Um and the nice thing about having a small bakery, a neighborhood bakery, is you're not trying to get too big a slice of the pie. And so we're not in competition with each other, you know? And there's so much room for more small bakeries in, Amer in America, but it, absolutely in San Francisco. Um, there's not a culture of small bakeries here, bread bakeries specifically. And w I really am excited to see what happens as bread that's made in these ways, you know, becomes more and more popular and more and more people want to eat it because I think there's just going to be more and more of them, bakeries. And, um, and I think it's going to be really great.
it's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting for everybody.